my research, I'm a bioinformatician, um, and my research doesn't fit neatly into a single box. You can't say that I work on you know, a single organism. I tend to work on a lot of different things simultaneously. So I just put a few uh, highlights up. Uh, this is sort of population genomics. So this is the, uh, the, the global spread of cholera around the world, which is some work I was involved in at the Sanger. Um, and so that was all underpinned by, uh, by uh, sort of big data approaches. Um, I developed methods and approaches. So you've heard talk about Brat Next Gen. I was involved in, in developing that. Um, I do pathogen genomics. I work on things like um, uh, the Yersinia uh, work or looking at Salmonella bongeri or comparing um, E. coli and sort of difference in gene content and that sort of thing. And then um, looking at these sort of what you might term <coughs> grand challenges, um, I, I'm involved in work in uh, de novo drug discovery in vaccinology based on genomics. So I work on a, a wide variety of things. And they're all underpinned by this, this, uh, this concept which is becoming de rigueur, which is big data. Um, and it is a bit of a, a buzzword, but it does actually describe something quite fundamental, which is, which is really important. Um, so about me, uh, I did my PhD at Imperial College London, um, supervised by uh, Brian Spratt, Christoph Fraser and Bill Hannage, who will almost certainly be known to all of you here. Um, I did a postdoc at the Sanger, spent two years there, and then um, in the transfer window for academics, I was recruited by Cardiff University <laughs> in preparation for the REF. Um, so, uh, and then what happened was I was, you know, a relatively young PI um, coming into a new institution. And so what happened to me was I started off with this. So my postdoc, I was at the Sanger, I'm a bioinformatician, and we had the farm and the Sanger system, you know, 16,000 CPUs of storage, petabytes uh, of uh, compute and petabytes of storage, all in, you know, purpose-built uh, data centers with very large numbers of administrators to run them. Uh, and then you leave that, you come to university, you start your own group, and then maybe you've got a single server. And if you're lucky, you might have some people to look after it for you. Okay? So that's, a, that's quite a big change. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty frightening one, because you're reliant on this to do your work if you're a bioinformatician. And as soon as you're here, suddenly things get a lot more scary. Um, so what happened to me? I, I arrived, and I was basically presented with an empty rack. And they gave me some startup money and said, spend this startup money. We think it's enough, which it never is. Um, and luckily, uh, we happen to have some very good system admins um, within the School of Biosciences. And we've been able to build a usable system, but it's taken us 18 months to do that. Okay? Actually, there's a picture of the system on, on the side here. So um, we've got a cluster with a few hundred terabytes of storage and a load of compute as well. Okay, so you can, you can do that. I mean, if you, if you want to work really hard at it and you, you know, you've, you've got the money, you can actually set this up. Um, and if you've got the staff there, you can maintain it as well. Um, of course, no one wants to help you do this, but once you've got it, everyone wants to use it, okay? which, is, which is another problem you've got as, as, a, as a bioinformatician particularly. Um, but what you're going to get here is always going to be a compromise. Okay? You're going to be limited by you know, the money that you've got. You're going to be limited by the fact that, um, especially with things like storage, um, it's very, very expensive to buy, lots of to buy small amounts of storage per terabyte. If you want to buy enormous amounts of storage, then the per terabyte cost drops quite dramatically because you don't need, a lot to, don't need to pay for a lot of the infrastructure. Um, and I could use the central HPC service. And when I arrived at Cardiff, people were like, well, why don't you use what they've got? Um, two issues with that. First one is it's not really set for biology. Um, as anyone who's tried to use an HPC service from a university is probably aware. Um, and also, you know, we have <coughs> crazy limits. So uh, the chemists, who are the ones who have the really major voice in uh, Cardiff in terms of the, the running of these systems as sort of user input, um, they thought that 50 gigs was fine. That's more space than anyone would ever need. Um, and then you come along and you talk to them and they say, yeah, we've got loads of space for your analysis. How much do you need? Five terabytes. And then you're talking about taking up 5 or 10% of the total storage available to the university system. And that's when they start to get quite worried and suddenly they're not very keen on using their system anymore. So what I've learned, well, we, sort of, we know that scientists work in silos, right? Um, we, uh, we tend not to, you know, we tend to be quite focused on what we're doing and on our groups. And what I think is, or what I can, can kind of imagine is the case, is that as a PI, it's a lot like running a small or medium-sized enterprise, okay? You've got your products, you know, your papers, 
you've got your income, which is your grants, and you've got to manage your staff as well. So you're expected to do everything, and the university takes a cut, but doesn't necessarily give you back what you need to do your job. And that's a real problem in this sort of area, uh, especially as a biomathematician. And so big institutes, people like the Sanger, have a massive advantage because they're focused on a single thing, they're set up for that single purpose, and everyone else, I mean, as a, as a, a small group in Cardiff, you're never going to be able to compete with a, an institute the size of the Sanger with their level of funding. And what it also means is that quite often, as a, a sort of a lab scientist or as a small group, you will lack infrastructure. When you've got that small pot of money and you want to go and buy your bit of hardware, okay, you're going to make a compromise and you are going to lack bits of infrastructure just because you've not got the money to buy whatever you want whenever you want it. And the problem there is that you tend to build up a system that's been built up in quite a piecemeal way. Okay, so you'll add bits of storage here or a server here or there. And so you never end up with a system that would be the way you design it from scratch. You actually end up with a system that's, 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 that's compromised from the start. And, I mean, the other issue is, uh, as bioinformaticians, we work in silos as well. So, you know, you, you develop a really cool script, and then you use that script to analyse some data, you publish it, and then you've got to somehow make that script available to the wider world. And quite often, the software that we build is built for our local system, our local environment. We don't necessarily test it properly for people, people elsewhere. And so software isn't normally, or certainly quite often, isn't portable. And... You know, I'm doing my research. I don't want to be supporting a, you know, an enormous number of users around the world as they've got problems setting up software because I'm not being paid to do that. The university don't care if I'm helping out people elsewhere. They care about my outputs they can measure, so my grants and my papers. And so this comes to a, a concept of saying I have, which is called the sequencing iceberg. Okay, so um, what we find now, sequencing is very cheap. Okay, we can get a very large number of bacterial genomes sequenced for very little money. We can produce enormous amounts of data for very little money. Um, but your major costs and your major difficulties are in that bit of the iceberg that you don't necessarily see. Okay? And we all know this as bioinformaticians, I'm sure. Um, the principal three areas are your informatics expertise, your storage availability, and your high throughput computing capacity, okay? so your computational capacity. And that's different to high performance computing capacity because we're actually trying to do something different uh, quite often when we're doing um, our sort of uh, analyses. And we actually costed some of this for a recent grant, and this is less than 5% of the cost. This, storage availability, is 20% of the cost, and informatic expertise is 75% of the cost for doing these sort of analyses. Okay, so this is a standard sort of exome scale um, project in, in human, in, in human um, subjects, and the key bottleneck is actually here. Okay, so the good news for bioinformatician is that actually, you know, you're, you're, you're the most important part. The bad news is that the bottlenecks are salaries, so um, wait, just wait till they start cutting those. Um, and these three are interlinked, okay? and they, they are expensive. They're a lot more expensive than you think. So you have a set of really uh, quite large challenges. Um, the first of these is what's called the big data Vs. Okay? So data size, or volume, data variety, and data analysis speed, or velocity. Okay? So you've got these... These three competing uh, elements which, which actually affect how you do your analysis and how you build your system. Um, we've got questions around how we standardise our, our data, how we create and store metadata, really important for our analyses. Um, we need expertise to run our systems and to securely store our data. Uh, we need to know how to make best use of our resources. We don't want to leave resources um, and not having them used. We want everything to be fully utilised if possible. And then, of course, the, the one at the end is always cost. So where does that leave us? Well, our data sets are quite different to traditional HPC. Okay? Um, they're generally large memory, or they're enormously, in, embarrassingly parallel. You don't tend to get much in the middle, so either you need loads and loads of RAM, or you need loads and loads of CPUs and not that much RAM. Um, and these approaches are now becoming our fundamental research <coughs> tools. And most university HPC resources are set up quite nicely for, um, uh, for, for HPC type tasks, but they're not really set up to handle our data. Um, and then we have a host of other concerns, um, which if you start to think about them, get worrying very quickly. Data, data protection. So if you've got a single server and that server fails, what happens to your data? Okay. Um, you go, when I arrived at Cardiff, um, people there thought RAID was backup. 
And if you talk to computer scientists, RAID isn't backup. RAID is just a protection against hard disks failing. Um, if that RAID array fails, you lose your data. So um, what happens if your hardware fails? How do you make sure your data is always available when people need it? Um, anyone here written a data management plan and they promise to make their data available online to anyone who wants it? <laughs> you know, how, how, how do you make that happen? That's, that's an issue. Um, data ownership. Anyone here save <coughs> data on Dropbox or, or Amazon? And if you have, have you checked the terms and conditions about who owns that data when it's, when it's stored on their system? It's an important issue for governments. Uh, data management and data security are also key problems. Uh, if you've got patient data, data security is going to be an issue. Um, if, a, if somebody comes back to you and says, you've published this nice piece of work, I would like that data, can you put your hands on the data associated with that project, yes or no? Um, and these are, these are all potential problems. So research data management is, is a lot more than just storage. You've got questions about how you track your outputs. How do you store your data long term? Um, in, uh, in storage, you have different tiers of storage. So you have some sorts of storage that are very good for long term storage, but are quite slow. And you have other types of storage that are very quick, but are very poor for long term storage. So how, how do you manage that? Uh, how do you manage your research data? How do you retrieve old research data? How do you meet your research counts and journal requirements? And basically, because I've done this, I've implemented this system at Cardiff, um, it's a difficult and expensive process to get this working. Um, and the only time it really makes sense is actually if you do it on a large scale. Okay, so as an individual microbiologist, an individual group, it makes no sense at all for me to, to implement a system like this. But when you start to move out, when you start to move into a larger scale, it starts to make a lot more sense. So this is where cloud computing comes in. Um, if you go large scale and you share, so you share across institutions and you share with institutions as well, um, things actually get a lot easier because A, you have more money to play with, and B, you can, you can, start, you can start to share some of the burden. Um, and, and it was based around this idea that actually I thought a big shared computer made a lot of sense. Because quite often within an institute, there aren't enough microbiology groups generating enough data and bringing enough income to justify a very large system. Okay? But if you get four groups across the UK, I mean, initially it was, uh, it was Sam and I, and then, and then we, we were joined up with, with Mark and, and Nick. Um, if you've got that critical mass of people, then you can start to justify it. You can start to come up with a system that makes sense. Um, and so the MRC gave us a very generous amount of money. Um, with approximately half of it, uh, give or take, for compute and storage. And the idea is that we want a, uh, an infrastructure which will provide the mechanism by which we can actually meet all of those challenges that I've mentioned. Um, so, I mean, I think of this as iceberg breaking um, using the cloud. Um, so we're going to create a system um, which hopefully is going to remove the need for groups to worry about hardware uh, maintenance and support. Um, all the things like storage and compute and networking that really you don't want to have to care about as a biologist, whether you're a bioinformatician or, or, or a lab scientist, um, that's taken care of by the consortium effectively. Um, and then there's a single system which you go to for what you need. Um, and because we're now sharing servers, there's a single system which you can <coughs> effectively get part of the use of. Um, you have a mechanism for actually standardising your software. So rather than having to provide an install package, you could provide a virtual server for somebody to use. Okay, so there's then, that then takes a lot of the hassle out for you of maintaining versions that work across various different operating systems. So, I mean, in terms of uh, how this actually works, if we take a data center with many servers and much storage, um, you have a very large number of servers. These are plugged into the storage. And we can take a user who wants one of these servers, and actually, you know, this is a, a big server, very expensive, um, but we can take a chunk of that and we can give that user a chunk of that server using what's called virtualization. Okay? And then we've got all this server left over. So if, they were to, if that user were to buy that server on their own, okay, all this would have been wasted. But using uh, this same technology, we can then also assign other users other chunks of that server as needed. Okay? So what you get then is you get a shared system, <coughs> which, is, which is shared in the sense that it's a shared data center, but also the actual individual servers are chunked up and shared as well through this system. Okay? So that's how the cloud works. Uh, fundamentally, if you go on Amazon Cloud, if you go on Google Cloud, they have a very large data center with a lot of servers in it. And when you go on and you say, I want a server of this size, it spins up a virtual machine, which is the requisite size, and places it somewhere on their system. 
So our aims, uh, we're trying to create a public-private cloud. Um, it's used by UK academics in the first instance and microbiologists primarily. Um, we're going to have a set of standardised cloud images. So those will have sort of some of our key pipelines and hopefully we'll get contributions from the rest of the community as well. So you come up then with a sort of a standardised way of, of interacting with data. It makes it much, much easier to share methods and, and for everyone to get access to methods as well. Um, there'll be a storage repository. Um, and the idea is this is to link up, so you could potentially link up things like the European Nucleotide Archive. You could, one of the things we're thinking about is working out ways of actually encapsulating research data sets. So you publish a paper, um, you've been using the system, your data's on our system, and then you create effectively a single link to that research data set so that someone else can then come along and just link directly to that research data set and pull it down. And um, you know, the, ultimate, the ultimate aim, actually, is, is to also create a mechanism where you can encapsulate the workflows you've been running as well. Okay, so the idea being that a user can come to that system, they can read a paper, um, log in here and say, I want to, to carry on from where this paper left off, and it will spin up the virtual machine with the data and with the software, so you can literally carry on using the same methods from where the previous people left off. So it's a, it's a way to make data more reusable. Um, and then obviously we want to provide access to other databases from within our system. So the system itself, uh, four sites at present. Uh, it's connected over Janet. Uh, we're lucky in the academic world is we've got a very nice, fast um, connection between institutions and we're going to use it. Um, you might break it, but we're, we're going to use it in the first instance and just see how it goes. Um, and the idea is there'll be a, a set of sort of standardised VM images. And these images, if you go on, uh, say, Google or, or Amazon, there are an enormous number of sizes going up from like, you know, very, very tiny to, to, to quite large. We're going to offer just sort of three, three standard sizes, which are sized to reflect the sort of user need that's there. So there'll be sort of personal, which is sort of for sort of a, um, individual, say, PhD students or postdocs might want to spin up a personal one if they're the only people in the group using it. Um, uh, sort of a standard one, that's a sort of two to three thousand pound server equivalent. Um, so that's sort of the sort of thing a group might spin up. And then we've got sort of a large memory. Um, so we're just going to have large, large and huge are going to be together now. Um, and that's going to be machines going up all the way to one and a half terabytes of RAM. Okay, so we can, we, can sort of, we can sort of provide capacity. And that size of VM, uh, beyond 250 gigabytes of RAM, is actually larger than anything you can get commercially at the moment. Okay, so that's a genuine service that we'll be able to provide microbiologists that nobody else can do. Um, so the system's going to be able to support uh, over a thousand virtual machines simultaneously. Um, there'll be around about four petabytes of storage, um, and there'll be local high performance storage as well for actually running your jobs. So pretty picture, diagram, that's what it looks like. Um, we've got the four principal universities, and we've also got um, collaboration with Cypher, which is uh, one of the e-health centres that's currently based in Swansea. Um, and uh, so we're going to be looking at ways to actually connect their database of patient anonymized data um, with our system to give people a route to actually access and analyze that as well. And, you know, sort of uh, we, we, the idea is <coughs> users will be able to ingest data. So say you get sequencing done at the EBI, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, BGI, for example. Uh, the idea is you'd be able to actually get that directly from their FTP site and put it into our system. Um, hopefully you'll be able to submit data to databases like the, EN, uh, the ENA. And then obviously there's the possibility of exporting the virtual machines that you create into other clouds like, uh, like Amazon or, or, or Azure or Google. So uh, we're currently in the process of coming up with a tender for this, so the chances are that the VM specs will change. Um, idea is there'll be effectively three um, uh, VM sizes. Uh, personal, so four CPUs and 16 gigs RAM, so sort of high-end workstations sort of grade with high-speed high storage. Uh, standard, so sort of group size, eight CPU, 64 gig RAM. Uh, I run a, uh, a bioinformatics, I run two bioinformatics modules for final year students, and, and one, one for final year students, and one for master's students. And this size server um, for standard bacterial workloads is fine for about 60 students uh, over the autumn term. So I mean, that, that's sort of probably good enough for any group. And then for, for large and complex projects with very large numbers of genomes or with very specific needs, uh, we have this capacity to scale up to, to really massive uh, um, memory machines. And the advantage of these are, um, these are the sort of machines that you would find it very difficult to get funded on a grant. Okay? Your chances are your university doesn't have any of these. Uh, we certainly, at Cardiff, we don't have any, any machines in this sort of range uh, centrally. Um, so 
there are there are limited number of places you can go to to actually get access to that sort of capability. And uh, if you're a microbiologist and you're doing medical bioinformatics, then uh, will be one place you can come to, and we'll be able to sort you out with a machine. Um, access. Um, None of this is useful if it's a pain to log on to. Um, so we're going to be using uh, Janet, Federated Access System. Uh, if you want to know what that is, uh, everyone here is probably familiar with Shibboleth. When you're signing on to, um, say, uh, journals, remote access for journals. Uh, Janet also provides a mechanism for doing that for SSH as well. And we're going to be making use of that. And we can also set up special accounts for, for individual collaborators um, to give them direct access into systems. Um, and the idea is you'll be able to provision uh, as a sort of a standard user, you come on, log in, you'll be able to provision a, a set number of virtual machines um, and the really high memory machines are by special arrangement only. Um, so timescales, um, we're currently in the process of starting to procure this, so we've got a pretty aggressive timescale. Um, we're hoping to actually confirm the order in the summer um, and then delivery in the autumn, um, starting to do some testing and hopefully we'll have something running by January next year. So chances are that's not going to happen, but um, <laughs> I'm fairly sure we'll have procured it by then. Um, it's it just, you know, you know what computers are like and what software's like. So reminder of who the, the consortium are. Um, the, uh, the people who've managed to get themselves um, lumbered with actually designing it are, are myself and Nick. Um, so we're the ones that will get shouted at when, when things go wrong. Um, which is why it's important that we have the system admins in place because then we can direct everyone towards them instead. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's a, as a, so, sort of concluding remarks, it's an MRC funded project to develop a cloud infrastructure for microbial bioinformatics. It's about four million pounds worth of hardware, about a thousand uh, individual virtual servers. So chances are that means we could support potentially a, a, thousand, a thousand groups uh, effectively across the UK. Um, and it is effectively an Amazon or Google Cloud, but for academics working on microbiological questions. I thank you for your attention. Thank you.